Stephanie Unicorn here. This video should not take longer than 20 minutes. Your time is precious and valuable, and I want to thank you for every minute that you're about to spend with me and encourage you not to spend it on people who are really not worth your time because you are precious and you are valuable. Anyhow, so the Kevin, the Kevin, the question from Kevin Samuels, you know, to the white and Latina, basically non-black group of women who, um, I guess he asked them, why are black women married less than their women? And on my community tab, I said, how would you guys like it if I gathered some of my white aunts who are married to my, I have a truckload of black uncles. One of my grandmothers gave birth to 10 children. So we're just a really large group of people. Anyhow, um, I asked you all, would you like it if I gathered my white aunts and asked them this, the same question in reverse? Because these are non-black people who have been living with a black family for a long time. And these are not women who have taken that black man and isolated him from his siblings and, and extended family. You know, no, they're, they're, they're at every cookout. They're not just invited to, invited to the cookout. They are expected to cook, to bring food, to bring desserts, to bring platters to the cookout. Um, and they have perfected their prospective dishes. They know what their strong points are. That's not the point. Please take your time to exit the chat and like the video. It does so much for getting me out of certain algorithms that I don't want to be in and into algorithms that I would rather be in. Um, so call me Coco. Um, I mean, I, th I think this is, I, I just adore this girl. Um, she made a video and she's like, you guys, look, they're going to piss you off again. Gucci is going to piss you off again. Prada, the, the, the H&M, when they had the little boy in the, in the, I don't know, whatever, monkey in the jungle or, you know, these, these blackface type of uh, trending clothing of uh, slavery and Jim Crow caricatures. Um, the black men with the, the hair-headed hooligans and the German shepherds and the BT2, three, four thousand, whatever they're saying, that they're going to upset you again because your outrage is currency, black women, and it's really sad. I'll say it the way HD Tour said it. You're not just being attacked and gaslit by black men, but it's also your society in general. It's your society in general. I just posted a video of a little black girl who was literally walking down the street barefoot in 102 degree Texas weather. And um, basically she was having some kind of a panic or anxiety attack. And this cop decided to lay on her on top of her in an extremely sexual position with his growing on top of her growing with his private parts on top of her private parts. And she's foaming at the mouth and he won't get up. And he took off his body camera, of course, and they had to, you know, record him with a cell phone camera. And it just turned into some kind of a brawl. And I'm just like, of course, it's emotional. It's a mother trying to protect her daughter. And cops should be prepared for that. They should be ready, you know, for the human element of that's my kid. And she couldn't breathe. So when she's foaming at the mouth, she's she's like crying for her mom. I can't breathe. Like he was laying on her stomach with all of his big male body. This is a teenager. Okay. She can't breathe. She's scared. She was already crying. It's 102 degree weather. She's on her back. Like it, it's just really very bad. And of course people are going to tell us, you know, well, what's the origin story? What was going on? And I'm like, she wasn't resisting the officer. She was just crying. She wasn't fighting the officer. She was just crying. And there is no need for all of that. For all these different white men who are these killers who spray a whole group of people and they're apprehended alive without being shot with their weapons armed in hand like it doesn't make sense that you can't then apprehend a teenage black girl but of course when we call that out we are gaslit there is gaslighting there is mental manipulation to the point where people go right outside of their minds you know they just it's hurtful anyhow um so one of the things call me coco was preparing you for she's like look they're going to upset you again find another way to respond because this outrage has become like like black women we are the free pu publicity stunt like if people want to piss us off if the kardashians want to be in or whatever they can just braid their hair and you'll cry they can just put in some bantu knots and you'll cry and i'm not criticizing you because you know i cried out myself um 
but I had to learn, you know, that there has to be another way to respond. And I think the better way to respond is to ignore those people. And if it comes to us, I mean, to educate ourselves about how to move better, right? How to move in a way that is more beneficial to ourselves because getting online and crying and screaming and being angry, it's just, you know, even though it's very valid and other people get to cry and scream and be angry without their entire group get, getting painted with that brush, we don't. So anyhow, um, what I wanted to say while I am live streaming, uh, or this is not a live stream, but it's um, I'm recording, is that um, this question that he asked, these women could have easily been asked to Ralph Richard Banks. Why didn't he ask Ralph Richard Banks? I mean, if I could get into the resume of Ralph Richard Banks and Dave, if it's okay, I'll call you back. If I could get into the um, Ralph Richard Banks resume really quickly, I mean, I just wrote an article on this man. I mean, you wanna talk about somebody who's a Harvard graduate. You wanna talk about somebody who graduated from Harvard Law, somebody who graduated from uh, Stanford twice, I think, and ended up teaching at Stanford. Uh, his bachelor's degree and his master's degree are from Stanford. And then finally, like, this is a man who is given to gender research, social sciences, and the law. He knows what he's talking about. And he answers Kevin's question here. And this is not new. I mean, you can see by the nature of this video that this is actually old. But the point that I'm making here is that these things are meant to trigger you. These things are meant to hurt you. And not only are they meant to trigger and hurt you, but they're meant to entertain people who don't like you. They're meant to entertain people who are anti-Black racists, sis. And they just are even if they don't admit it, even if they like to braid their hair, even if they like to dance to hip hop music, all these people who are watching that man, like, like, like that is the problem. Either they are self-hating pick me's who are trying to prove themselves and get picked, or these are people who are anti-black. It's a very short spectrum. It's a short continuum uh, of people. And I don't want you to be discouraged by the fact that this man has a million followers, because in reality, that's still, that in the grand scheme of things, that's still very small. So anyhow, when it comes to why Black women are married less than our non-Black counterparts, the answers are here. And I want you to watch this video because I need you to be armed with the knowledge to answer back. I don't ever want you to be in a situation when it comes to something like this and you're humiliated and embarrassed because you don't know what to say because you can't articulate your point. You know that there's a reason, but sometimes you can't find the words. These are the words. So with that being said, I'm gonna go on ahead and play this. And if I need to do some commentary, I will, but that should be it. University. Reinvigorating gender equality in the 21st century. I'm uh, delighted to welcome you here to uh, hear Professor Rick Banks talk about his new book, Is Marriage for White People? All too often, people who study race study race, and people who study gender study gender, but we all certainly know that as actual individuals encounter major social institutions like marriage, they do so as people that are both simultaneously raced and gendered. And so understanding how those things work together and how they affect our experiences in major social institutions is really important. And I'm just delighted that he's back here at Stanford uh, to talk with us about the book that he's written. So welcome, Rick. I should probably start um, with the issue that has gotten me into the most trouble uh, with this book. Um, and it, it has been more trouble than I expected. Uh, uh, one of my favorite statistics uh, related to the book is every single time I talk about it on a radio show, uh, and this is in major cities, actually in all cities, though. Um, there's at least one person who calls in and says that uh, I'm promoting racial genocide and self-annihilation uh, or some variant of that. And the title comes from an article which, which I had read uh, that was in the Washington Post in which a young black boy in the city of Washington, D.C. told a reporter 
that marriage is for white people. And he told the reporter this because the report said, or the, the child said, you know, we want to learn about how to be good parents and how to be good fathers. The reporter said, great, uh, I'll bring in some married couples to talk to you about parenting. And he said, no, 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 we don't care about parenting. We just want to know, I mean, we don't care about marriage. We just want to know about parenting. And then another kid said, yeah, marriage is for white people. And that struck the reporter because it was the starkest expression you could imagine of what these children experienced in their social world in Southeast Washington, DC, which is that marriage had declined so much among African-Americans that they didn't think black people got married. They thought marriage was something that other people did. All right, so that's the first meaning of the title. Uh, and that's the attention getting one. It captures all the emotional energy of the marriage decline among African-Americans, uh, which is unprecedented historically in our nation. Uh, but I also like the title for another reason. Uh, because there's another meaning to the title. We could also think of the title as, you could think of the title as, is marriage for white people but not for black people, but you could also think of it as, well, is marriage even for white people, right? So a white person could look at the title and say, oh, you're asking, is marriage for me? And they usually have an answer, no, yes, you know. And, um, and that's intentional, that it has that secondary meaning, is marriage even for white people? Because the goal of the book, uh, the sort of starting point of the whole project is to connect the experiences of African Americans to the experiences of all Americans. There are three big issues that I highlight. One is the marriage decline. Uh, marriage has declined throughout American society during the past half century. Uh, that decline has been uh, greatest among African Americans. Uh, nearly 70% of black women are unmarried, uh, but white women too are more likely than never to be unmarried. Uh, for African Americans in particular, the marriage decline spans the socioeconomic spectrum so that even when you look at college educated black women, they're, they're more likely to be married than less educated black women, but they're less likely to marry than their white college educated counterparts. So there's a racial gap in marriage that spans the socioeconomic spectrum. We see it among women, we also see it among men, right? Black men at every income and education level are less likely to marry than white men, even as white men are less likely to be married today than they were 40 or 50 years ago. For whites, uh, white women are about five times as likely now to earn more than their husband compared to 40 years ago. Uh, 40 years ago, only a few percent of whites earned more than their husband. Now it's about 25%. But among African Americans, uh, we see an even bigger shift. Uh, and this is one of the statistics that's really startled me. Um, among college educated black wives, so these are college educated African American women who are married, more than half of them are better educated than their husbands. And that educational gap is very significant because uh, education is more related to earnings now than at any time over the past several decades. Pivotal factor here in both of these developments is that although women are doing better, which is a good thing, men are doing worse. And this is especially the case among African, well, it's true generally, right? More women than men graduate college nationally, but it's especially the case for African-Americans. Uh, again, uh, you know, as a father of boys, right? These are all, this is, this is part of me. This book was very difficult to write, right? Very difficult to write. Uh, one in 10 black men is in prison uh, as we speak. These are men in their 20s, early 30s. It's actually a little bit more than one in 10. One in 10 are in prison. Estimates are that one in four will go to prison or jail at some point during their life. At the other extreme, nearly twice as many black women as men graduate from college. Now we don't see that here and you don't see that other elite colleges because we pick our classes but nationwide, nearly twice as many black women as men graduate from college. So women are moving ahead, men are falling behind. That's the underlying, that's one underlying factor. There are many of them. That's one underlying factor that contributes both to the marriage decline and to the increase in couples where wives earn more than their husbands. There's a third issue that I spend a lot of time on, and this is probably the one that people focus on the most. Um, and here, there's a, there's a puzzle. Uh, the puzzle is that black women, this is what pulled me through the book, really, sort of really pulled me through, is that black women have the smallest pool of potential partners within their relation, within their race, right? Because so many black men are incarcerated or unemployed or not in school and so forth, right? So black women have the smallest pool of men within their race, yet black women are also the least likely to marry outside of their race. Why don't more black women have the relationships that they want? When I went out and interviewed people and I, and I talked to women around the country, um, 
you know, I thought I might find a lot of people who said, you know, I'm not married, I don't want to be married, and uh, I'm taking a principal position. Uh, but in fact, I didn't find that. Um, I found that a lot of people actually do. A lot of women wanted, like most people, a partner. And that's not the be all and end all of life. It doesn't mean your life is bad, and it doesn't mean that you know it's a lost cause. But it does mean that you know having a partner is maybe something that would make my life even better. And there were a lot of women who said they wanted a partner. Um, and then I began to think about the book in terms of this puzzle. Uh, if there are fewer men within the race, why don't more black women find that partner outside of the race? In the same way that black men and people of other races have already done. Right? So that became the orienting, the orienting question of the book. Uh, the book is also a, a feminist book, I think, in that, uh, and this was the probably the most difficult thing one of the most difficult things for me is that the book does open up relationships between African-American men and women in particular, but also men and women generally, uh, and highlights the different interests uh, and the power struggle that often occurs within those relationships. Uh, the model of relationships that I, that I use in this book is one that you could say is drawn from sociology because there's some sociologists who embrace it. You could say it's drawn from economics because there's economists who embrace it. But the model of relationships is not one where you look into each other's eyes and you, you know, find your soulmate and you love and care for each other because you just love and care for each other so much, right? It's really one that in which relationships are negotiations. Relationships are negotiations in which people act instrumentally to try to accomplish a goal. And as with any negotiation, the outcome of the negotiation depends on the power that the parties bring to the relationship. And there are a lot of sources of power in a relationship. But one source of power uh, is the options that each party has outside of the relationship. So that if um, uh, with men and women, with black men and women in particular, uh, if you have few men, because a lot of them are in prison for, for reasons that are not of their own making, for these big reasons, right? We have black men who are not doing well. But if you have few black men who are out and are you know, good partners potentially, right, or good prospects, and then you have a lot of women, that numbers imbalance means that the men have more options than the women. And more options translates into more power, fewer options into less power. So with that being said, you really don't have to listen any further. However, I think it's important to listen further because you need to be armed in a way that you can defend yourself in a respectable way because you as a Black woman deserve to be respected. But basically, this this scarcity of Black men, because in reality, there's not a scarcity of men. There's a scarcity of marriageable Black men. And so when they say we all want the same men, some of that is true because there's a very few uh, compared to us. We're not saying there is, there are no good black men. We're just saying there are more marriageable black women in a position to actually be a wife than there are black men who are actually in a position to be a husband. Now, I'm not talking about struggle love. I'm not talking about, well, at least I have a good heart and at least I have a steady job at Walmart. I'm not talking about that. I'm like an actual, like, we're going to live a middle-class life. There are more African-American women in that position than there are Black men. And part of the power in a relationship is the power that you have outside of that relationship where you can say, if you don't like it, I can leave. If you don't like it, I can leave. There are There is a line of women waiting for me. And here's the deal. There's a line of women that are even waiting for dusties because Black women are so alone and desperate. You know, certain populations of us who haven't gotten here with the pink pill and with some of these um, <clears throat> femininity and Black women and luxury movements that encourage you to just go for the man of your standards and, and choose color or, and choose character over color, right? But keep in mind, that's a huge power dynamic. As a Black woman entering a relationship with a Black man, you automatically, right, like there's less power. Like, for example, one of the ways that you can exert power in a relationship is money. If you are the breadwinner, 
Now, of course, so many African-American women breadwinners, they are constantly spending themselves broke in the name of men who don't make money because they're trying to prove how submissive they can be because we get, you know, attacked as masculine and things like this. Even if we're not, even if we're just assertive, even if we just speak our minds, even if we just stand up for ourselves, if we don't lay down and take it like, like, like a roach takes a boot, we're masculine, right? That's what they'll call us. And then, you know, it, it's the threat of, oh, you're going to die alone. It's like, all right, well, what do I have to do? How far do I have to go as a pick me in order for you to stay with me? Right. And that's a horrible, disgraceful, disgraceful, hateful place to be in. But yes, there is that power dynamic. And a lot of black women who will not put up with certain behaviors of black men who have, you know, six or seven women waiting on them. They're like, all right, well, then I'm out of here. So there you have one reason. And that's true even if nobody ever invokes that power or nobody ever refers to that options is something that we all sort of know so that's the framework for the book and with black men and women it might be that uh it is the case that black men have too much power and that black women have too little power and that results from this numbers imbalance that is starker among african americans than for any other group and that just basically that just screws up relationships when the power is that far out of whack. And unpacking this puzzle about why black women are the least likely to marry out. So he just answered the question of Kevin Samuels. I beg your pardon. I'm having these um, steak fries and I'm trying to, to swallow here. Anyhow, um, so when these women climb themselves up there, because again, remember when I tried to have my white aunts do the same thing, these are respectable women. And they were just like, I don't feel qualified to answer that as a question. And that's the right answer for a white person to give you. Even if they do live with one black man, in reality, they don't live with all black men. They, they haven't lived with thousands. They haven't like, like, who are they? To be outside of the group and have such a conversation. And that's the point. And this is why the women on the Kevin Samuels panel were so incredibly, I mean, it was disrespectful, it was crass, it was low class. And I'm looking at some of those women like, why isn't he telling her she's fat and overweight the way he told that black girl she was, you know, like this woman clearly has a round face and rounded shoulders. Like, why isn't he, you know, I mean, obviously because this guy's an anti-black racist, right? And you don't have to be a white person to be, you don't have to be a non-black person to have anti-black racism with you, right? It's an indoctrination. So because we have these numbers more so than anyone else, that is one of the things that contributes to why we are not married as much as other people are. And now he is about to get to the psychology of black women. And this is great because this is why he's going to get to why words like bed wench hurt us so much. But if we were to say bed buck to a black man who swirls, it wouldn't hurt him as much. It wouldn't really be a diss. It wouldn't really be a dig. Right. So he's about to get into that. So go ahead and like the. Um... Um, is that I, I sort of unpack all the different things that keep black women segregated in re their relationships even as other groups are increasingly integrated. Uh, and that's a, a conversation uh, that exists where, at least I think that before there was silence, right? Or at least not much, not much discussion, right? So it's a conversation about things that we don't usually talk about, right? It's a conversation about the fact that lots of black women want black babies and they want black babies because they want to, uh, be able to you know raise the next generation of the black race uh, they want black babies because they are worried about being mistaken for the nanny uh, they want black babies because they worry about their child being so light that the child could pass for white and they don't want a child who could pass for white because if the child could the child might not identify with them uh, it talks about the fear uh, on both sides of the racial divide that people have about a partner's family not accepting them uh, about a, a black woman who thinks that a white partner's family say would not accept her and frankly about a white man who thinks that a black woman's family won't accept him a potent sense that a lot of people have that that 
for, for black women to cross the racial line in their search for a partner is to do something that in some way is disloyal um, or unnatural or in some way an abandonment of black men. So of course, Black women as mothers, as nature's nurturers, we have this thing where, where the Black community can guilt us into staying with them. I've had men, even married men, upset with me because I am now coupled and paired, like, like they wanted me to be available for them forever. And I'm just like, you are married with kids. Like, why do you, like, why are you even speaking to me this way but there's a level of entitlement that a lot of black men feel to black women and we get shamed like how dare you what you think you're better than black men don't forget where you came from like what's wrong with you you're supposed to help a brother out you're supposed to lift every voice and sing you're supposed to take him with you and you're supposed to carry him on your your back yonder to victory and you're supposed to supposed to be the mule of the community and you're supposed to be the backbone and you're supposed to be the centerpiece and you're supposed to be the support system and you're supposed to hold that man down you're supposed to put money on his books you're supposed to you're supposed to you're supposed to you're supposed to you have a responsibility to the black man that black fathers don't have to anybody to the point where on a global stage on an olympic stage people assume naomi naomi osaka's father was an absent father because the entire world is associating black men african-american men in specific with being deadbeat dads because it's out there the world is getting smaller and smaller every day and the secret is out I was listening to Moko Mami and she was speaking about a couple at a bar that were having a chat about why Naomi Osaka's last name is Osaka. Now, anybody who knows anything about Osaka, they understand that anybody born in that area where she was born, they take on the last name Osaka. In reality, she has a very present African-American father who loves her dearly, who she wouldn't be a tennis star without, period. But... The assumption that the couple at the bar made was, oh, maybe he's not around, you know, because clearly her mom is the Asian one and she's got her mom's last name, which means she doesn't have a dad. They concluded that really quickly. Quick, fast, and in a hurry because she's half black. So black women are expected to remain in a way that black men are not. You see black men all the time being celebrated for being with non-black women and, and black women being made fun of. I remember, you know, T and Tamara, they have their experiences. They're, they're biracial twins. So technically, is it really dating outside of your race if you're half white and half black? I mean, I don't know. But, you know, Tia married a black man and Tamara married a white man. And Tia has heard no such things about her marriage to that black man that Tamara has, such as being called a white man's whore. And it hurts her so bad. And she really goes through it for being with Adam Housley. But then you juxtapose that with, with any, with, with any black man with a, I mean, Kanye West memorialized it in the song, you know, and they gonna keep calling and trying, but you stay right girl. And when he get on, he leave your ass for a white girl. In other words, you know, as soon as you build him up into the man he always wanted to be, now you are no longer the woman he wants to be with. Now you are no longer fit for this new image of success. Nick Cannon said it best when he was just like, you know, I would have got lunch for having that white woman. I would have, you know, I couldn't even look at that white woman and now I can have her. So she's a symbol of success and power and blah, blah, blah. And as a black woman, you're not. Or at least not to them, right? But black women have fallen for the okie doke. Black women have been run amok. Black women have submitted to, oh, I'm a bad person. I remember even being at church, right? Because I grew up in these loud black churches where there's lots of shouting and dancing and, and, and you know, spiritual overtakings, you know, mounting possession, whatever you want to call it. And because I sat very kind of cute and quaint with my legs crossed at the knee and my hands in my lap, like, you know, I wasn't screaming, praise the Lord. How? Like, like, you know, like I'm the type of person, like when I was in church, I would raise my hands as I sing a church song um, during praise and worship and I might cry. Right. But I wasn't the one 
in the aisle shouting, right? I wasn't the one, you know, passed out. I actually think somebody did pray for me one time and knocked me down. I think I've been knocked down by a couple of pastors actually uh, onto the floor to the point where they kind of have to cover you with the sheet. But like, he was like, oh, you think you too cute and too educated to give God a praise? Uh -huh. And I'm just like, no, I'm just, I'm just not loud. If I'm loud, I'm fierce, I'm angry, and I'm ready to I'm ready to shut somebody down. When I'm in a spiritual mood, like normally that that doesn't happen. Tears fall. But I'm just like, he was judging my praise in a way that like, like he was offended as a person who was not, you know, a collegiate kind of it wasn't his thing. And so, you know, I, I felt coerced to, you know make all these really loud noises and these really loud, you know, hallelujahs and whatever else. I mean, when it comes to the call and response, turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, I would do that. But I wasn't just, you know, hop a bow shot to the top of my lungs. And some people felt like that was uppity and like it was arrogant. And it's like, oh, you're too good. And I'm just like, man, I love being black. Just, just let me be, let me be alternative black has nothing to do with you. It's not personal, but there are things that black women get. That's just an example of the ways that black women are guilted into certain behaviors. And they can do that with it because men are more selfish than that. But women are, um, we're not, we're not wired that way. So here we have a, a little bit more. And Certainly a lot of black men feel that, but also a lot of black women feel that, right? And this is this sense is accentuated uh, by the fact that black women are doing so much better than black men, right? Nearly twice as many black women as men graduate from college. Um, and that creates a tug um, on many to kind of, you know, stand by the man, bring him along, uplift the race, progress together rather than progress alone. Forgive me, I'm chilling. I don't want to choke. <clears throat> so you see here where he said, let me go ahead and rewind. To kind of, you know, stand by the man, bring him along, uplift the race, progress. Situated uh, by the fact that black women are doing so much better than black men. So you have in some of these manuscripts, sweethearts who are like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. African-American men are doing just fine, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, one, you've never been to America. You don't know any African-Americans in real life. Stay in your lane. We're not going to tell you about the men in your country. You shouldn't be telling us about the men in ours. But when you think of Rick Banks as a Harvard graduate, as a professor, as a scholar, as a reputable source, he is saying literally, Black women are, it's a ratio of two to one. Black women are literally doing twice as good as black men. Not one time, but two times over. So not just co-equals, but, but we trounced you, we doubled you. <clears throat> We're doing twice as well as black men. And that's creating, an, that's creating a divide. And it's also creating a, a, a guilt complex where the entire culture, black women included, other black women included, are like, you know, how dare you? How dare you be successful and leave us behind and wh whatever else. But also, like when I say that, say this, please understand that this is in general because my partner has a, a couple of master's degrees. He's more educated than I am, more capable than I am. Um, but understand that that leads to the fantasy dynamic that so many of these men want. And surprisingly, my partner never demanded this, you know, follow me blindly submission from me, but it's just kind of natural because he is such a genius and is so capable. You know, this, this African-American man that I am grateful to be with. However, to call him a unicorn is not to insult African-American men. It just is what it is. It is the facts, according to the scholars, not according to social media influencers, but according to people who reflect and think. 
right? Nearly twice as many black women as men graduate from college. Um, and that creates a tug um, on many to kind of, you know, stand by the man, bring him along, uplift the race, progress together, rather than progress alone. So you might have better relationships with men of another race who share socioeconomic class, share educational aspirations, share professional experiences than with black men with whom one does not share all that other stuff. And then the final point, this is um, another one that's gotten me in a lot of trouble, is that, you know, to the extent, part of the problem with African-American relationships, again, is that the men have too much power, the women have too little. And when black women expand their own options and counter that power disparity, uh, and create a more equal level playing field, so to speak, um, that might actually result in African-American couples having better relationships, right? And that results in African-American couples having better relationships because, you know, one factor, I think, and this is, you know, one factor in the, the racial gap in marriage, even among the affluent, is that they're simply too many women given the number of available men. And when you have lots of women and few men, marriage rates decline because men more than women tend to prefer relationships that might be non-marital, non-monogamous, non-committed. I'll just put that out there. Men might tend to refer relationships that are non-marital, non-monogamous, non-committed, at least at certain points in life. And when you have few men and a lot of women, men are able to be the deal makers and women have to be the deal takers. When women have better options, power becomes more even. When the power is more imbalanced, women can become more the deal makers and can then achieve relationships with men that are more to their liking, which may more likely be relationships that are committed, that are monogamous, and it might result in marriage. All right. So the ultimate paradox the book rests on is that although we see interracial marriage, or some people see interracial marriage as an abandonment of the race or a betrayal of the race, it actually serves the race. Right? That even if black women are concerned especially about the stability of African American families, the best thing individual women can do to promote that stability is ironically to open themselves to relationships with people of other races and thereby equalize the power balance between men and women and put all African-American relationships on a more stable footing.